welcome to another addictive episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast with your host and sailing addict, David Howes. Hi folks, welcome to episode 79 of the Ocean Sailing Podcast and this week my good friend Andy Lamont interviews Matt Andrews who has a long and illustrious career in sail making from Apprentice right through to America's Cup and Volvo Ocean Race level. Matt started sailing on Morden Bay in the early uh, 70s with his dad. Uh, made the leap from the Mirror to the 125 before moving to Balmain and Sydney, buying a Sabo and then eventually jumping onto 16 foot skiffs as a 15 year old. He left school, went into sail making uh, and eventually landed a job in Denmark uh, after talking his way into uh, a position with North Sales. North then relocated Matt to Spain which led to opportunities with Telefonica and the Volvo 70 campaign then the America's Cup in Valencia which led to Matt joining Emirates Team New Zealand a year later uh, and then on to Kenny Reid's Puma Volvo campaign 2008 and 9, and finally the Telefonica team in 2011-2012. In this episode with Andy Lamont, Matt shares some lessons for everyday sailors uh, and uh, talks about his recent change of role to father, business owner and dinghy sailor on the Tweed River in New South Wales, Australia. So I'm uh, editing this uh, episode on board my yacht Ocean Gem as I head south from Hamilton Island back to Southport. Uh, after completing Hamilton Iron Race Week for the fourth year in a row and I'm about halfway through the journey, about 30 miles north of Gladstone currently and uh, conditions are fantastic so it's an opportunity to get some much awaited podcast editing done. So enjoy this episode uh, with my good friend Andy Lamont uh, who talks to Matt Andrews. Hi, this is Andy Lamont, and I'm uh, sitting here speaking with Matt Andrews. Uh, Matt's had a, a, a long and amazing sort of history in, in sailing and, uh, and just launching into a new business with Flow Sales to start sail making on the Gold Coast in Queensland. So, but Matt, uh, welcome, and I'd like to, um, if I can take you right back to when you first started sailing and where you, where you started and where was sure. that? That was with my dad in Morton Bay. Oh, Morton Bay. Mm, okay. Just up the road here in about 1970-something. Yeah. I, I think he had a midlife crisis and wanted to get into boating and he took me with him. Okay. So that was the beginning of a long story. So, so you just got on the boat and... Yeah, he, had a, he, he bought a mirror. Oh, yeah. If I remember correctly. Yep. And we uh, took that around off Victoria Point. Yeah. Probably the yeah. first place. And did you race it or just... No, he never raced a boat. I never raced with him. Yeah. Racing came after. Right. So you spent a few years with your dad in the mirror? You were like, yeah, a couple oh. of years with the mirror and he, then he bought a 125. Okay. And we had that for a long time. Yep. yep. So used to buzz around uh, between Coochie and Maclay Island up there. Yeah, yeah. Just northern. you and your dad? Or? Just me and my dad, yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. In a northerly. Right, yeah. Just, just sending it back yeah. and yeah. forth. It was yeah. fun. Yeah. It was fun. And so then, um, so then you, so it was just you and your dad starting. How old were you talking? Then? Oh, that's like eight, nine, early te- teens, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. And then I moved to Sydney. Yeah. Uh, with my brother and my mother, and and that was one of her conditions. That's how she convinced me to move. Actually, she said she'd buy me a boat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you find another woman like that? Or? <laughs> <laughs> she bought me a little green Savo called Splice, I think. She insisted that it was called Woodwind. Yeah. She's a clarinet player. Right, if so. So it had to be called Woodwind, and that happened to be a Dremoyne sailing club. We moved to Balmain, Sydney, and, and we sailed Savos out of Dremoyne for a couple of years, me and my brother. Which was a big, big sailing club, wasn't yeah, it? It was a big sailing club, like 16s, poker machines. Men yeah. drinking beer, yeah, yeah. you know, I've yeah. never seen anything like it Yeah, yeah. up here. Uh, that was the real McCoy down there. The juniors had a Galaga machine to play outside, I remember. A video Gala- game. Oh, right, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. While, while we were waiting for a lift home. Right. <laughs> okay. And so you started selling your Sabo there? Yeah, the Sabo there. And then, I must have been 12 or 13, I think the skiffs, the 16s, used to have four hands. Yes, yeah, and you needed a, a little light you young needed fella. a little light bloke and I, there was a guy that I went to school with called Lincoln McDowell and he he I don't know how he he tapped me on the shoulder one day and said do you want to go fourth hand in the skiff I sailing and I said yeah and that was a boat called 
Lenvine Mazda. They were a car dealer on Victoria Road, Dremoyne there. Yeah. And I sold that as a fourth hand one year, maybe. And then he bought a boat for his son. Right. The skipper yeah. of that boat bought a... Bruce Kinsella bought a boat for his son, Mark, who didn't want to steer it. Right. Okay. And so they got me to steer it. So how old were you then? Like uh, 15, maybe? 15, you were steering a 16-foot skipper. Yeah, it was great fun. I mean, that's and that, oh, that was the year very... it went to three hands. It went to three hands. Right, yeah. And uh, so all the fourth hands were sort of chucked out. And, uh, and I, yeah, he bought a boat for his son and I steered it. Right. It was, it, was, it was great times. We had an older guy in the middle, Kerry Moore. He'd been doing it a lot of years. Yeah. Uh, and the first day I sailed with him, he'd just had a vasectomy. Right. And he was very uncomfortable about the whole thing. But his words still ring through my head whenever I get in a skiff. Which was? Keep it flat. Keep, keep it flat. flat. Pull away, pull away, keep it flat, keep it flat. Keep yeah. It flat. All day long. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just, every time I get in a skiff, I just... Just keep it flat. Keep it flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I did that for, I think, three years we sailed that thing. And we, we were pretty good at it. Dremoyne used to have around Cockatoo Island there, where you can now actually go on. Yeah. Very stop. Yeah. You weren't allowed to touch it in those days. It had a submarine strapped to the side of it that we used to bump into occasionally. But it had all these ammunition barges parked between the three islands there. The rumour was they were full ammunition. I never knew if they were. But in the northerly, the, we used to have to drive and run through these ammunition barges and I used to bash into those things. Oh, like, I used to hit them? Learning to sail that skiff, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully they weren't so full of that. Full of right, yeah. So, um, so that's amazing, isn't it? At a 15... So that yeah. was, that's not, not a very common thing for a 15-year-old so. to get... A, to it, was, it was a different time back then, I feel like, in the skiffs. Like, the, you know, they're old... Wooden, there was a whole sort of... You know, there were older boats and newer boats and, and you could get in at the lower level and, you know, work your way up sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, Whereas yeah. Whereas now yeah. I feel like it's all... It's got to be a carbon... Yeah. $40,000 boat or yeah. something. Yeah. 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 But there were old timber boats there and the first one was an oldish boat... But um, what was his name? Warren Robinson Insurance, he sponsored us. Right, He was an old-timer from the club. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was a timber boat, but she was a beauty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boat. And did you have much success? Or any success with it? Or? Yeah, we won the, the point score in it. I think in the second year we won the, what they called the handicap point score. Yeah, yeah. Which was, you know, we did a lot of those, what do they call them, kangaroo starts? Is that what they call them with the... Everyone goes behind the one boat going to windward or...? No, no, you know, the handicap starts, so the 20-minute oh, yeah, so goes at 20 minutes and then oh, yeah, the yeah. scratch boat's going 20 minutes later yeah, and yeah, there's a whole yeah. bunch of boats in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did a lot of that and, you know, if you want to race, you lost handicap and if you... Yeah. And I think we got nine seconds that oh, year. That's all right. Yeah. We, we, that's how you win. That's how you win. <laughs> yeah. Out of yeah. 20 odd races or something. Yeah, oh, that's good. And so then you, then you well, obviously were... Um, 15, 16 and... Yeah, I think I was 18 when that all came to an end. Mm. And then I think I sailed on a really old boat for a while, on the sheet in the middle. Yeah. And then I got on a good boat, the the club champion, the guy called Bruce Moore, and I sailed up the bow with him. Oh, okay, yep. And that was really good times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it was, there was something about just trusting the crew you know you just did your job and you did it the best you could you didn't have to worry about anyone else yeah you're just looking focused on your yeah bit. i felt when i was yeah. skippering that other boat it was a bit like you're looking after everyone yeah, yeah 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 but up the bow on that thing i loved it yeah and we went to a lot of regattas we took it to perth twice and sailed championships over there and, and it just blew every day and you just yeah. sent this thing yeah yeah, yeah yeah that free mountain doctor it was really yeah, great to sail isn't it it yeah. was good times yeah and the skiffs were great yeah, yeah. And you used to have to get up there and jibe the pole, you know. Right, yeah, because they didn't have a prodder at this no. stage. It was all... Yeah. Yeah. I used, to look, I used to love going and jibe that pole. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Because the 16s had a very flat spinnaker when I was in, on Sydney Harbour, which was probably... Yeah, right. So they went to big kites. The little the little one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they went to big kites. I think that very first year I fourth-handed was the year they went to big kites. Right, they called them. Yeah, yeah. They went from that wire off single what they used to call them I can't remember but they had a the old timers had some name from but we kept one in the boat I remember when in the boat so I was shy reaching, yeah. Yeah. yeah and every now and then when the when the breeze died or something weird happened and you could just pop this thing up and sneak along some shore with it yeah yeah but we had the big shoots yeah. and then geez, I is it 90 
five or six or something they went to the A the Genicas right yeah yeah I haven't kept up with them so no, I don't like know, yeah but anyway so you were you were you were sailing then and what 18 by that time you left school or you yeah finished school yeah um was playing football as well that sometimes overlapped I remember into the season yeah soccer yeah. I mean yeah uh, but really, sailing was the thing. I, I loved playing soccer, but yeah. you know, if there was an overlap, I was always sailing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I did three, maybe four years with Bruce in the what was he called? Deloitte's Touche Tomatsu. Oh, okay, yeah, that's, yeah. That's where he worked. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, we won the club championship in that with him a few years. He bought a new boat at one point. I think we got a. They had one of the national championships at Dremoyne one year. And yeah. That was fantastic. Yeah, that was really fantastic because yeah. uh, home waters and and we knew our way around and all. Yeah, the Sydney Harbour is just like yeah, that end of the harbour. If you don't know that, that's end of the <laughs> yeah. So that was really enjoyable. I think we got a did we get a fifth or a sixth? I think something like that. Um, all the big guns were there, Trevor Barnabas and. Yeah, all the all, all the big wigs were the there. Big, yeah, yeah, all the top stars. And they worked it out pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. And so you so you sailed in those, and then then, and so what were you doing for work then? You left school. Yeah, I left school. That's right, work. <laughs> uh, I worked. There was a little a guy had set up a. We made boat covers on site actually to start with. Okay. Yeah. He had a truck. With the on same site, mach- truck. And, yeah, sewing yeah, machine. Yeah, sewing machine and a table in the back and all the material. We used to drive around <laughs> western suburbs of Sydney. Laughing a lot, actually, at people and, <laughs> and boats. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, all these people out in the western suburbs of Sydney, they all had a boat on a trailer and it all, you know, they all had a wife that didn't really want it and they all had a carport that should have had the car in it and not the boat. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very funny to see that that other side of yeah. Sydney. Especially growing up in Dremoyne. Yeah, you, exactly. And then you go... I mean, right Balmain was a rough enough kind of area back then, but... But to go out there was it was yeah, it was yeah. funny times. Yeah, for the people listening, yeah. So Spalmain was in the inner city and yeah. nice and close to the harbour, even though it was kind of working class. It was very working class back then. Uh, not now, of course. No. It's, but but then if you went to Western Sydney, yeah. basically, it was uh, it was a whole another world, it was wasn't another it? Another world. Yeah, yeah. And I did that for two or three years, and then I went to a sail loft that was in Dremoyne. Right. So you learned to sail, obviously. Learned to sail. Yeah. And. Um, yeah, went to this sail off in Dremoyne right, yep. for a few years. Yeah. yeah Learned your sail making trade. Yeah, like, it's strange all that because I don't really feel like I learnt the trade there. Yeah. Yes, you, you, you learn, you know, to fix things and you learn to make all sorts of things in a sail off. Yeah. You know, so many things come out from, you know, signage to. Right. You to know, you, you're making things yeah. on a sewing machine. Yeah. You know, and every now and then we'd be making a sale. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I learned to sew and I learned the sort of the interesting world of people wanting to make their boats go faster. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, which is, a, which is a very interesting yeah, yeah. world then. Because it is. I mean, when you look at it in the, you know, in the importance of everything in the world, sometimes the most important thing in someone's life can be... <laughs> And speaking from personal experience, sure. can be just making your boat go a little bit faster. Yeah. You know? beating your mate. You, beating you, you, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I always said to these guys, yeah, look, we can make the new sail, but if you don't get to the starting line on time, <laughs> yeah. you know, forget about it. <laughs> yeah. Because sometimes, the, you know, the big things get lost in the little things. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's so true, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's so true with a lot of things. I yeah, guess. yeah. So you so you so you learnt this. You were working now in Dremoyne, making mm. sales, but yeah. not full time. And then, yeah. and then, then what was the next step in your career? The next step was that uh, I met a Danish girl, and I went to Denmark. Oh, right. Okay. In ninety eight. In ninety eight. Yeah. Yep. And uh, Denmark, home of the magnificent X shots, of course. Home of the magnificent X shots and many magnificent things. Yeah, actually, yeah. As it turns out. Uh, including North Sales, yep. which I literally bludgeoned my way into. Right, okay. And got a job there eventually. Like, on Christ- like the first thing I did there was go to their Christmas party. Right, it, the North Sales Christmas party. And the second thing I did there was go to their 20th anniversary of that business. Right. 
was it the first two weeks I was there was like just a party. Right. <laughs> Were you, did you get invited or did you just... No, it's because I, I'd started work like the day before then. The whole workforce was invited. Oh, so you actually the... got a job straight yeah. away? No, not straight away. I really had to knock on the door a few times. Yeah, yeah. And they but, thought, uh, um, Could you say, did you have any language skills or...? But they're so good, the Danes. They, they speak English. <sighs> they're so yeah. good. Yeah. I speak it now. Yeah. After being in there a few years, the Danish... Forced my way in there and, and really enjoyed my time there. A lot of fun people. Yeah. And the, you know, the culture change and the weather and the riding your bike and the yeah, yeah. You know, night shift. Night shifts. Night shifts in the summer. Pizzas, I remember a lot of. Um, and they, they, it was down by the water there in, in a place called Norhound, um, which, which is now just restaurants and stuff. They had to move. Right. The North. real estate became too expensive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I was part of that move to a, to a new loft. New loft. Yeah. Big yeah. place, fancy yeah. place, built yeah. new for the purpose. Yeah. Uh, had it all. Right. So, so you started off working there. So, how many years before the move did you? Oh, it was a couple. Couple. Yeah. It was a couple of years we were there, and and the sales just started getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and we couldn't fit them in there. Right, because the boats got, didn't they? Fan, boats got so you're talking 90, when did you get there? 90? 90, 90, I started work there, yeah, so there's a bit of a gap there I had to come home for, but I started work there at the end of 99. 99, yeah, and when 40, 45 foot was a big boat. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then by the, by the end of a couple of years, we were making things for 100 footers, you know, wallies and yeah. stuff, and they just got bigger and bigger and bigger, and the yeah. sewing machines got bigger and bigger, and... Yeah, yeah. My back got sore and sore. And <laughs> yeah, and so, so you, so you, what, what, what was your main role when? Or where did you start out? You started out just being a dog's body, and yeah, a little bit. I started out um, gluing sails together. Right. Okay. Um, just gluing the panels together and sewing the panels together, and then these sections would go to the floor, and a couple of guys on the floor would. Uh, you know, cut them and, and, and stick them together there and then they'd go to a, someone else on a sewing machine. Yeah. It was the first time I'd seen it sail making like a factory. Really. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where? And of course, yeah. you were cutting these sails out at that stage by hand? Or no, they had a pl- They, they had, had a, a plot. Yeah, yeah, right, okay. He, they he they, that was the thing that ran all the time. Yeah. That was just, yeah, yeah, okay. night and day. yeah. And so you were gluing them together and then... Gluing the panels together, get them, you know, get the panels off the, mach- off the cutter, glue them together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm. then uh, I did a while on the floor, cut a couple of my fingers off. <laughs> and uh, yeah, then- Yeah, see that, just running through the sail machine. No, they, we used to, to cut the leech, for example, on a big sail, we'd put a batten down uh-huh, uh-huh. and cut along the edge of the batten and you'd have bent right. this batten and put a pin down and then you'd be walking backwards, bent over, Dragging a blade, right? You know, right up the entire thirty meters of leech or something. Yeah. And I remember distinctly getting halfway along one, and thinking, "Ooh, lunch." Yeah. (laughs) Next time there was just blood pouring out everywhere. But don't get blood on the sides. No. Yeah. So, oh, right. Okay. Mm. So that was so. So you that was a you were doing that. Yeah. And um and then uh, and so. That was like 90, you're talking 99? Yeah, 2000, 2000, 2001. I think we moved the loft in 2001. Yep. And then did a couple more years up there. And then 2005, I wanted to move somewhere. But in North South Copenhagen, at that stage, was the centre of North South Europe. Right. They had all the connections. Yep, yep. And I went to, I did a little stint at a place called uh, Boyce and Miller Sales. He's, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know how many times, Flying Dutchman and 505 world champion. Yep. And then I went to Palma de Mallorca with North Sales. Right, okay. And saw some really big boats. Right, that's where they are, isn't it? That's yeah. where they are. Yeah, yeah. And, and so then, you, that when, when you're talking around the 2000s then? Yeah, yeah. mid-2004, mid 2000, I think I went down there. Yeah, For, yeah. yeah. And best, then, best time I ever had. Right, in Palma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good, good, good time. Oh, look, just good atmosphere. The Spanish just have this amazing balance of work, party, life. Yeah. Nothing seems to get in the way of anything else. Right, okay. They're really yeah. good at it. Yeah. I used yeah. to get picked up at quarter to eight. Yeah. For, 
for a 15 minute drive to work. Yeah. And somehow we had breakfast on the way. Right. I never knew how we did it. <laughs> Every morning. And you were getting picked up and taken to work? Yeah. Just because... Oh, just because probably I didn't have a car or... Right, okay. Like that. Yeah, yeah. So you'd have breakfast on the way and... So we'd have breakfast, which was always some sticky donut or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah. And then get to work and, and there was this older woman there called Julia. She was a dynamite. Yeah. Tiny little thing she was. She dragged these 100-foot sails out of the car and started spreading them out. Right. She washed them with a gurney, if I remember. Yeah. A yeah, hundred foot sail. She, she was a yeah. non stop. Right. And so there you were there, there in Palmer, and then, then what happened then? In Palmer, I met so many people. Yep. They had a regatta there called Copa del Rey, mm-hmm. and everyone comes. And I met, I actually met a guy who I had replaced. This guy walked into the loft, Italian guy, and he'd injured himself in the, in the 18 foot regatta back in Sydney in right. the mid 90s in the, in the Giltland Cup. And somehow they got hold of me, and I filled in for him in this in the oh, JJ's. Okay. And, and on the sheet, on this with two Italians, and he wandered into the loft this day. I was going, looking at him, and it, it was just a place where you met so many people. Yeah. And um, and just made all these connections then to the Cup, America's Cup, and the Volvo race. It's just people who were connected with those things just right. came through there at that stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then for a month or two of that time in Parma, they sent me to a place called Cuntas, which is up on the north west coast of Spain in, a, in an area called Galicia where, where they built... There's a north sails up there. Right. In yeah. this tiny little town. Yeah, yeah. It was like, it'd be like in Brunswick Heads. Probably the biggest employer in the town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Wow. And uh, I went there and that was a very, very funny experience. There were some very funny people there and, you know... Just <laughs> before I knew it, I arrived in this town. Before I knew it, I was sailing down the coast with a bunch of drunk Spanish people drinking martinis. Right. <laughs> That's just the way they, they did do it. it. Yeah, yeah. They were very funny people. Yeah. But yeah. somehow they managed to fit working in between. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? So yeah. you, you sort of see these Europeans, and you think in Australia we drink a lot, but but they can just they somehow they just stay, they just stay under the yeah. They keep it together, and yeah. they still turn up at work the next day. Yeah, ready to go. Yeah, yeah. But that was a really great time. Met a lot of people there. Yeah, yeah. And then that was your springboard into. Yes, that was yeah. building Volvo sales for the Telefonica. Well, back then it was called the Movie Star or the Movie Star. Yeah. Um, and we built some sales for that. That's where those sales were built. In fact, the home base. Oh, in for this that, little town was yeah. where where the, the and the home base for that Volvo team was just on the coast there. So these were Volvo sixty fives. They were Volvo seventies. Seventies, right? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. The early that was the early that might have been the first seventy. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And so you so That was the one that sunk. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Well they abandoned. Yeah, yeah. So that was the Movistar boat and, and you guys you built the sails. Yeah, we built the sails there. I, I worked with this Italian slash Spanish slash Swedish guy there. Yeah, yeah. So what was it? How how big was the team building the sails for the? So they had guys from the boat. Yeah. And they had a they have like a coordinator there in the loft, Claudio yep. there, and um, and then a guy like me that sort of you know could had some experience with big boats and could yep. sort of talk about that with him. And then they had all the girls in the loft. Just the girls sailing. sailing yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, they were 3DL sails, so, you know, the moulds were designed. You know, we'd, we'd receive the, the blank, as they called it. Yeah. And start putting it together there. Right. And suddenly the guys from the boat would come and visit and say, yeah, but can we now have this here and not there? And right, okay. So, so that you'd get a, obviously, I don't know how it works, but you'd get a set of sails... And they'd go sail them for yeah. a couple of weeks. They'd come back and go, now yeah. we need to do this. And, yeah. and did you spend much time out on the boat for like looking at Not the with that one. No? Not with that one. Uh, in, 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 uh, in subsequent uh, ones. Subsequent uh, campaigns, yeah, I got on the boat. and Yeah, 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 yeah. And so that Movistar boat, that sunk. Well, they, they got off it. They got off it, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, as, as I remember, as I recall it, they don't know exactly what happened to it, but they... Keel started swinging around while right. underneath it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was time to go. Time to go. So they got off that boat, 
And then, so that was what you we were talking there. I know we're talking, talking two thousand and five. Two thousand and five. Yeah, yeah. And then, what was your next project after that? The next project, North Sales then sent me to run a service loft in Valencia for the acts of the America's Cup. I don't know if you remember, but the America's Cup used to have these, well, they still do, have these acts, they call them, and they went around Europe. Oh, yeah, that's have, right. Yeah, yeah, holding so, these events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they did, they did the one in Valencia there. I can't remember which act number that was, but it was, and then they did one in, in Malmö in Sweden. And yeah. And they did one down south. Was it not in Italy? But the, the, the Valencia and the Malmo ones, I ran a service loft right. for North Sales. Because at this stage, the teams didn't have their own sale loft and their own sale makers and so forth. And so when things fell apart, they brought it into a North Sales tent, big one. Yep. And there were two of us Oh, it was there. a tent? Yeah, big tent. Yeah. Well, the first one, there was only me, actually, Valencia. I've never worked so hard in my life. Just you? Just me. And, and basically... And, what, and how, many, how many teams? Wasn't what, there 10? 10? Right. Was there 10 at that stage? So they didn't all need me, but there was a couple that only had me. Right, the yeah. The Germans yeah. were one of them. Right. The so Germans, some, some had their own sale makers. Yeah, some, but they still needed my space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they came with their own know-how. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but the Germans didn't. The Germans didn't. They were hilarious. And that was steered by a very famous Danish mattress called Jesper Bank. Yeah. He was a very funny man. And when he found out that I spoke Danish, he thought that was very strange. <laughs> yeah. There was an Australian sailmaker maker working, living in Spain, speaking Danish. Danish, yeah, yeah. He thought that was very funny. Yeah. But that was really, really fun. I had to repair machines. I had to... Oh, right. I was on the phone one night to a very for a well-known sewing machine mechanic, as well-known as they get. And he was at his dinner table that's, describing... That's a, that's a funny claim to fame, isn't it? It is a funny claim to fame, but he is world famous. <laughs> world he, famous star machine mechanic. Martin Zimmerman. Yeah. The, he was at dinner telling me how to fix this, you know... Yeah, yeah. 50,000 euro sewing machine. Yeah. Uh, but the Germans, yeah. I was fixing their sales like day in, day out, day in, day right, out. Right, yeah, yeah. But I met the Team New Zealand. Oh, OK. And yeah. in, in walked a man called Craig Phillips and I'd sailed with his cousins... In Des Moines. No way. Yeah, in the really? 90s. Yeah. And in walked Craig Phillips and he looked exactly like his cousins. I was like, hang on. Yeah. yeah. And we had a chit chat and he said, oh yeah, and we, we got to know each other there. And it was him that rang me a year later maybe and yeah. said, come and join us. Right. So then you came. So, so from that, you yeah. went to join Team New Zealand. Yeah, so I went Valencia, Malmo. I think I came back to Australia for a little while. Yeah. Didn't quite know what I was going to do. He rings me up and says, Come and join us. So you went to Auckland? No, I skipped the whole Auckland thing. Right, okay, yeah. I was already back in Europe, that's why. Right, yeah. So I went straight to Valencia, and uh, <laughs> that was, that was mind-boggling. I walked into a breakfast room with 120 New Zealanders. Right, <laughs> finally someone who speaks close to yeah. Australian. And, yeah, they, yeah. and they all looked at me and said, who's this guy? Yeah, yeah. So the team was 120-odd people. Yeah, I think by the end of it we were 120-odd. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe 100, 100 Kiwis. Yeah. I think we were like seven or eight Australians. Right. And then a mix of a couple of others. Yeah, yeah, right yeah. There. And that, that was, that was very, the, the Kiwis, they're, they're really good at working. Yeah. They, well, they, they do, well, they over, don't they overproduce for the size of the nation? The money they have. They yeah. had such, in comparison to the other teams, Oracle and Alingi and, you know, their money just, they, yeah, very tight budget. Yeah. But what they get out of it, was yeah. incredible. Yeah, yeah. Really yeah. incredible. Which is, you know, which is why this tiny nation has been able to do- nearly dominate. Yeah. They, of the American oh, Cup recently. They, they can't have a cup without them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the la- if they had the last cup without them, it would have been silly. Yeah, yeah. So, so now, what boats were these? These were the... Those were the, the, well, what turned out to be the last edition of those cup boats. The 12 metre boats. No, the, the America's Cup class. The America's Cup class. They yeah. called them, yeah. Yeah. The the cup after that was that trimaran versus the catamaran. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, so I spent two years in Valencia with that team. With that team. Or yeah. under two years, I think. Yeah, yeah. And what was your role? What, what did you you were? So we were eight sailmakers on the floor. Yep. And two designers in the office. 
just two designers. Yeah, well, then there was Craig, who was out on the boat, following the boat all day long. Right. Just just looking at the sails. Looking at the sails favorite. all day long. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and two designers in the office. And, yeah, so the sailmakers on the floor were broken up into two teams of four, and we did a day and a night shift. Yeah. The loft was open like 18 hours a day, I think. Right, Something yeah. like that. And they'd come off the water, all the sails would come upstairs... Uh, we'd go over them from top to bottom, see if there was any breakages. Yeah. Change things that they wanted to change. Yeah. It, it was such a black heart too, isn't it? Now you're talking about that before, but yeah. you know, someone's looking at the sail, going, "Well, I want it to twist, yeah. a, you know, an inch more at the top, yeah. be a bit more open here, and then someone has to translate that yes. into something cloth. we, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that was Craig's job, really. He that was his job. He could see things on the water. And, and then know what needed to happen on the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they also had cameras on the, on the boat. Yeah. On the sails. Yeah. And, and there was a, a man on the boat as well who could turn all that information into numbers. Yep, yeah. Um, and so between the two of them... Now, at that time, do you think New Zealand sail making, the team New Zealand sail making, were they on a par with everyone else or are they at another level? Well, they'd had the disaster of the previous cup. Yep. I don't know if you remember, the rig fell down and the boat filled up with water and all that. So the team had really been restructured. Yep. Um, in terms of the sail making, yeah, the, we were certainly on a par with everyone else. I had to laugh after the regatta because we, we made our own... Uh, inflatable battens for the Genoas. Oh, the Genoas okay. had these big inflatable roaches batons. on them. Yeah, they yeah. had these big roaches on them, and so if, when they bashed against the mast in, in attacking or in a luffing duel or whatever, if they were fiberglass battens, it's break to pieces. So that, we all had these inflatable battens, but we made our own. Out of this was one of the ways the Kiwis saved money. Made of like little mylar sort of. We had uh, some, some tubes, tubes that we wrapped in in, in carbon cloth. We then put a valve in and we welded it all and we pumped them up and they were really quite good but there was a big drama one day because one fell out of a jib and was floating in the in the harbour off Valencia and they didn't want anyone else to find it, any of the other teams to find it. <laughs> they were out there looking for this thing, chasing them, this is... And, uh, <laughs> and they were found it, they were stoked, I remember they were stoked to find it. And then after the regatta and everyone sitting down chatting to everyone, you know, you're allowed to tell what happened. Yeah, yeah. Turned out that Prada... Had, had had Pirelli making their inflatable batteries. Right, at like <laughs> yeah. so many million, yeah, yeah. And the, and the Oracle had, had uh, the same people who make inflatable bridges for the army to cross rivers right. making theirs. So yeah. it made ours look a little bit stupid. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, <laughs> that, but that, they, they did worked. the job. Yeah. At probably a tenth of the price. Yeah, yeah. And that's where the Kiwis excel. That's where the Kiwis excel, they really do. So they, they have these generalists, don't they? Like they have these people that are... Always, I lived in New Zealand for a while, and it's mm. like this Kiwi farmer, kind of cow cocky guy who can just do everything. Yeah. And then the same with their boat builders, yeah. they can do... Yeah, they were really good. The boat builders were amazing. I would, I would say it was so much about leadership, like the team. Everyone wanted to work for each other. No one wanted to let anyone else down. Yeah. And it was all the structure of the, of the team. Yeah. From, yeah. The, from the top down... It was it was really amazing to be part of that. Yeah, yeah, really that is amazing, isn't it? That. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because in in subsequent teams with the Spanish in the in the Volvo race, it, it stood out to me. It was clear, right? That you know you can have the best of everything, the best boat, the best sails, the best people, the best everything. But if you don't have someone leading it, yes, the people will die for kind oh, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the wheels fall off. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was amazing, and I could see it straight away. And I yeah, think that was because of my Team New Zealand experience. Wow, yeah, that is an amazing thing to go to be involved in, isn't it? Because yeah. it really is at the peak of human endeavour. You know, yeah. like it's yeah. like an F one team yes. or an America's Cup team yeah. or a space program. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's trying to it's trying to you know invent new things. Yeah, yeah, you know, for a purpose. That, you know, it's a boat race. And yeah, then, but. You know, there's a lot of people devoted to it, trying yeah. to trying to get this right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and to go on that boat, we we on race days. So we, Team New Zealand got through the, the Louis Vuitton Cup. Yeah. And won the right to challenge for the cup against the Lingi. And in those race days, 
someone from the loft. So two two of our boats and two of Alinghi's boats went out the harbour every morning. And so on the second boat of ours, one of us would go out every day. Okay. Out to the starting line. Man, no. Yeah. I, I went out on that one day and the atmosphere and to just be going alongside Alinghi and it was like half of New Zealand was down the walls there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah, was, yeah. It was yeah. nuts. Yeah. And to go out in the... The to get st- and Ben Ainsley was steering it, yeah. And he and he steers the thing back through the spectator float with me trimming a spinnaker. He's never touched the spinnaker on this thing, you know, trimmed the shoot on this thing before. And he just wanted to get back so he could watch the race because you know the race boat goes off, yeah. And we have to get the other one back, yeah, yeah. So this is this, this is a this is the, the sister boat, or the, the, the yes, yeah, the, 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 following the previous boat, if you like, yeah, yeah, they designed yeah. two. And Ben Ainsley was the... He was the, the, he was the backup... Well, backup. How can you call Ben, ben Ainsley the backup? But that's what he, he was. He right? was the second skipper, if you like. And so yeah. in, the, in the training, in our in-house training, Dean Barker steered the, 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 cup, the race boat. And Ben Ainsley and was ben the... Ben Ainsley steered the other one. He was, right, he was, yeah. He, he was daring. Yeah, was he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, for lack of a better word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was really like, it's, it was, he was the right guy to have, in my opinion, because he just pushed it. Yeah. You know. This is Dean Bart. Oh, Ben Ainsley, I mean, well. he, he yeah. just pushed it. Yeah. The limits, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somehow he could have a, you know, he could forget that the whole thing costs a million dollars to get there, you know, and just sail it like a... Yeah, well, that's what you've got to have, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's rare, isn't it? It's really rare because that pressure gets to nearly all yeah, of us. Yeah, because when yeah. you built the bloody sail yourself, you know, yeah, I'm going, no, don't break my sail. <laughs> he's just he's just sending it. You know. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, so um, so I guess pretty much that would be a highlight of anyone's career. I think so. I, certainly sail making for me. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. and then I did a, a Volvo with the Spanish team again, where I went around the world. Yeah, with, and from the beginning of the team to the end of the race. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That was one highlight, and then yeah. we moved to the next thing, which was this is the next, the 2000. And, uh, uh, so I did a part of the, that would have been the is it eight nine yeah. Volvo with the Puma, and then, but I just did the second half of that race from Brazil onwards, and like I mentioned before, because I needed someone to hand cut a sail on the floor. Yeah, well, tell us that story. So that's that was that that uh, by this time. Everything yeah. is is CAD design. Yeah. Well, it's all it was all three DL and it's all it's all yeah. yeah. No one's no one's cut a sail on the floor, yeah, yeah, yeah. a panel sail on the floor for uh, some years at yeah, this yeah. stage. And but but they've got these limited amount of sails. Yes. And they wanted a, a staysail spinnaker or something. Yes, they wanted a, a um, what did they call it? A Genoa staysail. Genoa you know, staysail. Like the inner four stays. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. And, and and the the problem was they couldn't just go get new material and build make a new, new sail. No. I had to build it out of the old, an old one, an old one. It's one that's already been measured in. You know, that's that's part of the part I of that. Remember seventeen? Maybe it was. I, I can't remember how yeah, many yeah, sales, yeah. but so so this is so you what you got a phone call? Or I got you? a phone call <laughs> from from a friend who was one of the eight sail makers in Team New Zealand. Yeah, he yeah. was then now one of two sail makers with Puma. Yeah. And here, and when they said they need, needed to do this, he said, "Oh, I know a guy." <laughs> and so I get this phone call from an American guy they called Kimo. 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 They called him and said, "Can you come to Rio and and cut a sail on the floor?" I said, oh, uh, "Yeah." Yeah. <laughs> so we did. And so now, you you designed this sail just? No, they had a. So they had a the had, sizes and the design. You know, they yeah. had a. But we were we were just we cut. An old sail apart to make panels. Yep. And we sort of made up the the shape of it. I mean, the, you know, the the foil shape of it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but we had to fit it in these dimensions, and we cut all these panels. and And I remember all these people coming in and saying, "But how do you know what you're doing?" Because <laughs> they'd never seen them in pieces before, you know. <laughs> they'd never seen. So, like, well, how do you know? so this is your this is a 3D molded sail. Chopped into a million pieces. Chopped into a million pieces. To make panels. To make panels. And, and, and people then we coming put panels. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the shore manager coming and going, what are you doing? <laughs> because no one had seen... Well, no one of that era anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That 
you know, it was nobody does it anymore, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And we hoist, they hoisted this thing. I went out on the boat and they hoisted this thing. And Kenny Reed goes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not just that at all. You know, thing, he loved it. I think yeah. people love, people like that of an older generation really enjoy seeing something yeah, yeah, yeah. backdated like that. And this was like all the colours All the colours are mixed up, the puma legs here and the heads up there. Yeah, yeah. It was all over the place. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think everyone just... You know, yeah, it was like yeah. a flashback. Or yeah, something, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. So, so that's amazing. So you got to meet some amazing sailors too, didn't you? Like yeah. Kenny Reed and Kenny Reed and some of the the people who sailed on that boat. The grinders they flew in from. Uh, they had these import races. Right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And, and back then they were allowed to fly in grinders that hadn't sailed the leg. Right. As yeah. I recall, and this American guy turns up, and we we said, "Oh, what do you do the rest of the time?" He said, "Oh." I jump out of a helicopter onto ships and shoot pirates. Oh, that was his job. That was his job. <laughs> like a Navy SEAL or something. <laughs> on the weekends, he goes grinding. On, in, in yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. But he was enormous. Was he? He was just like a chunk of a Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he comes in and turns the handles. Yeah, for the, for the, for the import race. races. And then goes back and jumps out jumped of a helicopter. helicopter. <laughs> in the Suez Canal or something. Yeah, yeah. somewhere up yeah. there. He was hilarious. So, uh, so, so that was, so that was the, 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 so you'd done the Movistar campaign. Yeah, that was the, the Puma Star, then. Then the Puma. I was only going to do that Rio stop, but then Richard took the end of his thumb off in Boston, I think it was, on a forklift, and so they rang me again. Right, yeah. So can you fill in for Richard? And I did the rest of that race. Right, yeah. Uh, Galway in Ireland. Yeah. Which is the biggest party I've ever seen. And Stockholm, which must have been the most beautiful city in the world, the yeah. Scandinavian summer. Yeah, Stockholm. yeah, yeah. Um, so, oh, that was great. So then, so the, that was, and then, you did, so that was 2000. So that was, is that 8, 9? 8, 9. And yeah. Then, and then Team New Zealand had the, held these events in Auckland. Uh, they called them Pacific Cup, the Louis Vuitton Pacific Cup. They right. were trying to keep the America's Cup sort of in the flow yeah yeah keep the froth going. keep the froth going because yeah. there was all that debacle about the the trimaran and the catamaran yeah. that was in the courts and so yeah forth. yeah and they had these events there and i went there to to run the sail off there for those events oh so you know now, now you're running the sail off now yeah i was yeah. managing it with another guy we had because we used four boats two oracle boats and two two new zealand boats so they had an oracle guy and me from two new zealand right yeah and we ran that together and that was a lot of work too but while i was there one of the other sailmakers of the eight sailmakers from Team New Zealand, uh, he rang me and said, "Do you want?" He was going to be the. He was going to be like the floor manager of the Telefonica. Right. Next challenge in the Volvo. Yeah. And he said, "Do you want to come and do that with us?" And so I went back to uh, San Chincho and Kuntas back there. Yeah. Which was a bit strange because I'd forgotten I'd been there and I walked down to the beach and I went, oh, I think I've been here. <laughs> and was part of that team from the beginning till the end. To the end, mm-hmm. right. And that was a... Um, well, and that's where you, you, you sort of really did the whole... The whole Volvo race. Volvo race, yeah. yeah. From, they didn't even have the new boat yet. They had the old boat. We were testing old sails. The thing about that team, they had such a history in the race by this stage. They had sails and gear everywhere they had yeah. containers loads of it so we had yeah. all this stuff to experiment with and they went crazy we yeah cutting things up and putting yeah. it up and, and so did you did you make any breakthroughs with those sort of things or you... oh we made a couple of failures i remember <laughs> uh there was a it was just when 3di i think it was the first volvo race with 3di which was the next progression from 3dl yeah and there were some issues there. And just for people, look, the difference between 3DI and 3DLs, yeah. kind of, they're it both made on a on, on a, a mold, mold, the one piece mold, yeah. And the other one, one ones with the with the, the yarns laid out. You you remember them? They you know you, they were a transparent yes. sail. Yeah, you see all the yarns. Yeah. The 3DI looked more like a a black or grey just sheet. Sheet. Yeah. 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 Um, and initially, that was extremely expensive. I, recall. I seem to remember we made the world's most expensive downwind sail. Right. And it was slow. Right. <laughs> so, te- so, Telefonica, massive company. Yeah, big budget. Big budget. Yeah. Yeah. And gold so medal, 49er gold medalists sailing at uh, Shabby Fernandez and, and uh, 
his name. Oh, Ica Martinez. Yeah. And a bunch of Spanish and uh, an Aussie guy up the bow. and Oh, Andrew Cape. Yes. Was, uh, yeah, yeah. Navigator. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, a bit of a mix in there, mostly Spanish. Yeah. yeah. Funny guys. Yeah, yeah. Mostly, yeah. mostly it seemed like fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're them. having good fun. They're so, having yeah. fun. so you made this most world's most expensive downwind sail and that was slow. That was just and really a piece heavy. of crap. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> and you said, "Don't worry, don't worry, I'll make another one." We'll make another one. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, so we were based there for for a while, and then we the boat was built in Alicante. No, the boat was built in Valencia. Yeah. The race started in Alicante. Right. And so eventually I went to Alicante and was part, what well, the later stages of the boat build. Yeah. To build things on it like the sheet rope tail bags and the. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, the beds. Yeah, right. Yeah. The cots went on for months. Oh, did they? Oh. Was it like, what, so how many iterations of cots? Oh, I it? can't even possibly remember, but it was, you know, we're going to have three here and one here. No, now we're going to have four here. You know, it was all about getting the weight aft. Yeah. As much of it to windward side as possible, you know. It was all about yeah, yeah. getting everything, yeah. you know, because in those boats you could stack everything to windward. Yeah. And um, I can't remember. I remember that it was the young guy, the young boat builder who, who nearly went mad moving fittings around. Right. Because yeah. it was the smallest space down the back. It was yeah, the smallest just... space in there, gluing. You know. <laughs> um, so I was part of the boat build there. And then we went to Lanzarote, the Canary Islands. Okay. For four yeah. months. Yeah. Beautiful place. Yeah, yeah. And, and they just tested. It blew every day. Yeah. They just, just tested. Blow, it's like a little wind machine yeah, there, it is. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And tested and tested and tested and tested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great times. And, and so I guess you would have really like not many people get that kind of experience to to have that much freedom to experiment with so many different ideas yeah so it gives you a real um unique perspective about what what sales can do and can't do yeah and it does and it gives you you know you think some things are just going to work well yeah and they just don't yeah, yeah, yeah. And you think some things aren't going to work and then it works. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. unless you, you know, you can picture things in your head from previous experience, oh, that's not going to work. Yeah. And then you build it and you put it up and it works. Yeah. And it, yeah, so you sort of get a real, yeah, it's such, such a, yeah, it's, I mean, the unlimited, pretty yeah. much unlimited budget on sales. Was yeah, it really time is the constraint. Time in the is the constraint. Yeah. Even with, you know, a, a couple yeah. of years to do it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember at one point that volcano in, uh, was it in Greenland or Iceland? Right, I, yeah, yeah, it was in one of those Nordic countries. Up. Yeah, and, and the whole team. No stopped one could because, fly. Yeah, no one could get in or out of Europe. Right. And we were all standing there down there by the boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, right. Yeah. So that's so. Um, so so in that race now, it, it, how did Telefonica go in that race? It, Telefonica did. They had the most. They had the. Yeah. They won the leg to Cape Town from Alicante to Cape Town. Yep. They won the leg from Cape Town to Abu Dhabi. Yep. The tradition was in the Volvo race or the Whitbread race. If you won the leg to Cape Town, that you won the race. Yeah. Cape Town, they won. We won to Abu Dhabi. We won. Uh, and to China, we won. To Auckland, we came in fourth, I think. Into into Rio, uh, it wasn't Rio; it was called Itajaí. Yep. Uh, came in second, which was an amazing leg. Yeah. It was an amazing leg. Yeah, that was that would have been the leg that really. That's the one that tested the sails yeah, that and tests everybody. Yeah, and the people, and, and the, the people, boat. everything. Yeah, yeah. There were masts falling down on the on the French boat. The masts fell down. The the Abu Dhabi boat ended up in Chile, I think it was. That's and, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had to stop. We stopped on the... Now I'm going to forget the name of the town down there. Uh, um, the most southernmost... The Shire? Yeah. Yeah. Because a bit of the floor was coming up, and the boat builders, one of them was the German boat builders, were climbing around the Andes on some... Trek just on their by, by coincidence on their holiday, right? They got the ring up and said, Can you come down here and fix this thing? So <laughs> the boat pulls in there, they get shipped down there, 
put the thing back together and then the, the, the weather turned in such a way that it was so much in our favour that we nearly caught the right. puma at the end anyway. Yeah, yeah. They, they were inside of each other. Right. It was the most amazing thing about that race, how many times... They finished inside of each other. It was incredible. After being apart, yeah. like... Now, they all come together at the finish. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we were second into there and then it started to go... And this is what I meant about leadership. It started yeah. to go a bit wrong into Miami... And then over to Lisbon, it really, we were then passed, I think, in the overall positioning going to Lisbon. Yeah, yeah. But one of my fondest memories of the whole thing is the import race in Lisbon. Yeah. Stuart, the other sailmaker, and I were sent up to the, the statue on top of the hill. Right. To, to call the breeze. Oh, okay. To call the breeze in the pre-race. Yeah. I think we were on the phones to the to the guys in yeah. the, in the yeah. duck behind the boat. Were you able to sort of yeah, give some really good information? Yeah, it was great. You yeah. could see so much. And you much. could see the directions. Yeah. And, wow. and you could see the tide moving. You could see yeah. there was breeze there and not yeah. there. And, yeah, yeah. And um, that was really good because it, it was something I knew how to do. You know, yeah. I felt confident about then. Yeah, yeah. I've been, yeah. Do, you know, in skiffs and so forth. I've been looking at breeze for I don't know how long. And then yeah, yeah, there yeah. I was. Yeah. That was great. It didn't make any difference because they made a mistake at the start and had to do a 360. Which is coming back to what you said. You know, like, it doesn't yes. matter what you do. No. <laughs> you got to you got to start. you got to start. Yeah, you got to start on the gun. That was good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and then there's a short, was a short leg up to France uh, where the home, where the bases were all built in these old World War Two submarine shelters. God, I can't remember the name of the town. And then the finish was in Galway. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was good times. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and, and so that was your last big... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then you decided then to sort of... As it turns out, we made a baby in Brazil. Yeah. So by the time we got home, um, it was time for that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's then you've got to make that decision, don't you? About yes. what sort of what how you're going to live your yes, life you and do. where and your there priorities were, are. There are lots of people in the Volvo who do it. Yeah, there's yeah. a school that goes around with them. Yep. There's kids in the school. You know, there's uh, there's wives that just travel. There's yeah, you yeah. know there's there's a whole system there for it to work. Uh, but I, I, at that stage, it wasn't for me. I was, yeah. 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 I, I was a bit of an older. Yeah, right. sailmaker maker by that stage too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be truthful. Yeah. And it's very physical, isn't it? It's extremely physical. Like It's very physical. And, and, and I was also just getting boat sails on and off boats. And stressed getting sail. But you no, know, you can't sort of like go, oh, I feel a bit tired. I'm going to nap and we'll no. get back in that tomorrow. I think in two years I had half a day where I was sick. Right, yeah. I did some dodgy thing in Spain there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so... So then you decided to come back to Australia? Or? Yep. Yeah. Came back to Australia with my partner and who, who did the race with us. Yeah. That oh. Was, she came with us all the way around. Did she? Yeah. She came and lived in Spain and, oh, there was a whole wives scene. Yeah, yeah. Coffee and cakes around the world. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, we came home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We came home. That was, that was sort of enough, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's interesting. So, uh, and so from being at the very, very highest level, mm. undisputably at the highest level mm. of the sport, and then uh, when I met you, uh, you were like the gun coarse hair sailor on the Tweed River. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and I guess, you know, like you couldn't get further away from the America's mm. Cup than to sailing, racing a Corsair. Uh, for people that don't know what a Corsair is, I mean, they are, uh, when they were designed, were they even a fast boat then? No. No. So we're talking about a boat that was designed in, or, or the first ones came out in the mould. I know, my one's a 1965 Yeah, it's around then. Yeah, yeah. And one you sail on is probably... Not much newer. Not much newer. No. And, uh, and uh, these Corsairs, for, what people, for people who haven't seen them or know what they are, they're, they're a 16-foot um, dinghy extremely heavy they've got a, a derallion center board and small sail plan small sail plan tiny little spinnaker yeah. and they've got to sail with three yeah <laughs> it's three up 
and uh, but it just goes to show you. Know, and and where where uh, where the Tweed River is is just like a little. Yeah. You know, it's a twenty foot container. The sailing club. Yeah, yeah. It's a twenty foot. <laughs> that's exactly right. It's a, the sailing club is a is a twenty foot container, um, and uh, but here you are and you're still having fantastic time you know it's yeah. amazing isn't it you it know? is amazing and uh so that and that's where i met you and and, and um and you know i the first time i saw you you were just giving a little demonstration on how to use the huh. spinnaker on a corsair and I, I decided to get a corsair because just a couple of my crew were corsair racing i said oh, well i'll get one too so yeah. and uh i was thinking oh this guy probably knows what he's talking about <laughs> <laughs> and um, and there's a you know you've made a few sales for people around the club and and uh, and uh, so it was really amazing to see and now just to sort of think like uh, and I and there's probably people like this all over because sailing is one of those sports where you know it's a kind of a fringe sport in a lot of ways yeah. you know you can be at the very top level I mean nobody could probably name the whole crew of the latest yeah. America's Cup winning. Team New Zealand boat, no, like, you know, mm. yeah, but um, but uh, it's one of those things where you find people like you in. And it, what made you come to Brunswick Heads or to Ocean Shores? There, you just yeah. My, while I'd been away those years, my brother had moved up from Sydney, and yeah, it just seemed uh, logical somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't know where else to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is the most amazing. It is a beautiful area, place. To beautiful be. place. The weather is. I think it's one of the most temperate places uh-huh. in the world as far as temperature yeah. goes and it's a little bit hidden and it's, yeah yeah it's, it's really nice place, yeah. yeah and um so from from all that i know um you would have learned so many things but you know when you're talking to people who, who are trying to get the most out of their boat uh you know i remember you just said with your skiff the first thing you ever learned was keep it flat yeah <laughs> And we were out on the little Elliot that we've got, and like we're going, why isn't this boat going any good? And it's like at forty-five degrees. And yeah. <laughs> I just let the main out and get the thing flat. And, yeah. You know, so that's one of the, you know, like, what, is there, there, there's sort of, I know in the time we've got left, just some some real basic things that you see, um, experienced people do. People sometimes people get into keel boats. Yeah. They forget all the things they learnt in dinghies. And, yes. Uh, a couple of things that you sort of would your advice would be get to the start on time is get to the start is, is on always time. a big one yeah but I sailed that Elliot the other day and, and I was just reminded how people forget to look around yes head yeah. out of the boat sort of stuff yeah yeah you know it was a downwind start and I just had my head out the back looking yeah. where the breeze was yes yes you know and it just it's the first place I look yeah, because that's that's the the thing that makes you going the easiest thing to find that's going to make yeah, you go yeah. faster. Sometimes the worst thing you can have on a boat is too many instruments, isn't it? On yeah, oh, absolutely. You know, I just turn around, have a look, see what's coming. Yeah, and then just yeah, just to have the the trust in your ability, I think, is an important one. If you feel like you're doing the right thing stick with it yeah yeah you know and if it turns out to be the wrong thing then next time you know that you know what i mean you because you're building this if you follow someone else around i just i just don't see what you're gaining you know yeah. if you're, you're choosing something for a reason you know the reason it works great it works it doesn't work great it doesn't, it doesn't work. work you've learned something wrong reason yeah 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 i guess that's right if you follow somebody all you've learned is to follow them yeah yeah and you don't know i don't you know, don't know. It happened in that, that race up at your club there at Southport. They were all hugging the shore there downwind. And I couldn't work out why. I was thinking, well, well the breeze is out of here. Yes, it's a longer distance to the mark. But yeah. surely we're going to stay in the breeze and get to this mark. Yes, and we sailed around them and got to the mark. Yeah, yeah. Whereas we've been following them. You know, I just would have been always wondering why. Well, who is this guy? Is he a local? Or, you know, yeah, does he yeah. know his way around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just, just feel like you stick to your... Yeah. So, so basically, you know, trust yourself. Trust yourself. Because, because at the end of the day, if you're wrong, you learn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then I would say your crew, like if you, if you believe that you're, or you trust your crew, that they're doing the right thing, it just allows you to be doing your thing yep. to the best. Yeah. 
which is the first thing you were saying when you got on a boat where yeah, well, everyone was, was good. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's at the cup you learn that. You just learn that everyone has been brought there for a reason. Yes. They're good at it. Don't you know? second guess it. <laughs> Don't second guess it. <laughs> Don't second guess it. Exactly. Yeah. And and I just I you know, the people you sail with I, I find to be you know, sure, you're going to have to, you're bringing someone new on, you're going to have to show them the ropes and so forth, but I just think you get a feeling for people pretty quickly that, you know, they, they're good at fitting in with people or, and they know this particular job and they'll be drawn to their particular, you know, the thing they're good at. Right, yes, yeah, and yeah, because people want to be appreciated. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly, people yeah. want to be appreciated. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And what about in, in uh, sales, like... Um, yeah, so it's... Sales, you just you want them to fit your rig. Yes, would be the first thing. Yeah. I'd say you know, which is so important because you can order sales from anywhere. Yes, but do they fit your rig? Yes, and 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 every mast is different, and every you know boat bends a bit, and four stays go loose and stuff. Yes, you know things things uh, boats are not like a you know they're not yeah. They're not just a. So, so in your opinion, this is a, this is a, an interesting question. How often would you say you could order a sail, get it made, and it be perfect? First time. First time. Pretty rarely, I'd Pretty say. Rarely. But I mean, that's the way uh, sail sail yeah. making is going, isn't it? Yeah. You know, like you. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, and you see something, they don't fit at all. Yeah, yeah. They just don't fit the rig. And and if people don't know it. They just sail with it anyway. Yeah, yeah. And it's not till somebody who does know it looks at it and points out and says, That's "I made right. a set of sails for the the black boat, Debbie and Scott down there." Oh the yeah. There. yeah, yeah. And that bought well. The previous owner had bought some sails from China, I think it was. They, I think you put your dimensions into, and it comes back. Yeah. It was an awful thing. Yes. They were just awful. And and I spoke to them about it and tried to be a bit gentle and breaking it to them, but they were very open about it. And we made a set of sails and and they yeah they it's, took it's, off yeah the difference is amazing yeah. yeah yeah and and I guess that brings us back to the idea of what um, you know I we we've embarked on this stupid idea of building a sail loft. It's just an un, it's an unusual idea. Yeah, in 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 Karaman Valley. Mm. You know, um, but the whole idea is, is that like um, that you can you can get sales made, but they 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 might not be right the first time. You need no. a sail maker yeah. to look at it on the boat and go, well, we're just going to tweak yeah. it here, and we're going to tweak it there. And often sail makers, you know, it's a, it's a it's it's just knowing who's going to pay for that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So. Yeah. They sort of make the sale and go, there you go, and then they sort of baffle you with bullshit, and, and yeah. you still, your sales, you know your you sale's know not why. right. Yeah. Like for me, you know, you might know your sale's not right, but you don't know why. why. Yeah. And you need someone with experience and knowledge to actually look at it and go, look, you know, what we need to do is yeah. you know, half an inch here and a quarter inch that. there, and you've yeah. got something that's actually really working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I mean, that's, that's the philosophy about, uh, I guess, what my philosophy was, I was really like keen to get someone of your stature involved in making sales. It might not be a big loft, yeah. um, and we might ma- might not like it make a lot of sales, but at least you know you can guarantee the sales that you're making going to fit your boat. Yeah, you know, um, is that is that what you think too? You yes, I think I think it's it's almost a little old, bit old school now to have the sale maker come out for a yacht with you and on the Thursday afternoon. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Matt Andrews talking to Andy Lamont. Since editing this episode and prior to publishing it, I met with Matt at his new sailmaking facility in northern New South Wales and I was so impressed that I commissioned him to make my brand new number one spinnaker, which I'm going to use for the first time in next week's Sydney Hobart Yacht Race. If you want to contact Matt, go to flowsales.com.au. I'm going to post his contact details on the website on the Ocean Sailing podcast.com forward slash podcast page uh, i'm also going to post some photos of my uh, spinnaker making experience and some of matt's historical photos in the ocean sailing podcast facebook groups so check those out there thanks for listening to another episode of the ocean sailing podcast email your comments and suggestions to david 
at oceansailingpodcast.com.au. See you next week. If you'd like to find out more about joining me on board Ocean Gym, my Beneteau 45 for an upcoming ocean race, ocean passage or regatta, go to oceansailingpodcast.com. Check out the calendar. We've got some great stuff coming up up and down the east coast of Australia. Uh, and then an exciting race across the Tasman that we'll see happen for the first time in decades from Sydney to Auckland in February 2021. Thanks, folks. Catch you soon. So turn around and hear them speak. So turn around and help them out. Turn around because you're watching them cry. And watching some getting ready to die. Then knocked down to the ground and can't get back up. Feelings are sad. I want to be mad. Days here are like precious gold. If you live another one, you have faith to carry on. So turn around and hear them speak. So turn around. Turn around, cause you're watching them cry And watching some getting ready to die The memory of their courage is taped in my head It plays a soft one too I painted a picture I picture cold, dark sand and skies I painted the future how it's supposed to be With warm sun in a bright town So turn around and hear them speak So turn around and help them out Turn around them cry and watching some getting ready to die